Alex Rubalcava, I am thrilled to have you on Outlier Academy. Thank you so much for joining me. Daniel, great to be here. So I wanted to start, um, we're going to spend the majority of the time today talking about investing where others aren't looking, because I think that's a common theme that shows up in um, all of the verticals and companies uh, where you're a major investor. But I wanted to start first, and we're obviously going to get into stage venture partners and what you're building there. Would you mind just starting with a quick sketch of your background, just to kind of give people a high level overview? Absolutely. So I have been an investor for my entire career. I started as an analyst over 20 years ago at a venture firm in Los Angeles called Anthem Venture Partners, which is one of the oldest firms in Los Angeles that is still an active firm today. I spent a number of years there as the only analyst supporting four partners in a fund that had a very deep tech focus. We were doing things like analog and mixed signal, semiconductors, communications and networking equipment, biologics and stem cells, um, some very cutting edge stuff. And that I think has given me a taste uh, as an investor ever since for companies that have a high degree of technology risk, that have a high degree of product risk, and that don't usually have to worry about competition risk. I try to do a very similar approach to the investments that I make in enterprise software, which I think is somewhat unusual. And uh, after my time at Anthem, I then launched a fund when I was 25 years old doing long, short public equity investing. I did that for a number of years. Along the way, I made an angel investment or two every year or so, maybe every two years, not, not frequently, not in a you know structured, processed way, but purely opportunistically. And as that portfolio started to mature, my results from that left my day job of public equities in the dust. And it was very clear that uh, I'm pretty good at the public equity stuff, but I'm just a lot better with startups. And uh, I decided to listen to the universe when it tries to tell me things and return to my roots. And I started Stage in 2015. My focus is on highly technical enterprise software startups. I invest in them at Seed, and I've been doing that now for uh, about seven years. Yeah, which is an incredible background. I, I want to talk for a little bit about those early years at Anthem Venture Partners. I mean, one, you talked about the link between, you know, the te- just how deep tech focused they were. And obviously that's translated and you've kind of carried that forward. One of the questions I want to ask is, you know, I, I think for people, for most people who become a venture investor, it takes rewiring your brain because, you know, some of the mechanics, some of how it works, some of what you're looking at and what you're trying to underwrite, it's just very different than public markets, for instance. What support surprised you about venture early on? I would say that the amount of fear that people have for things that are technically complex or hard to build was surprising to me because I kind of thought that was the point. And in venture, what's exciting about those kind of investments is that they front load all the risk. If something is so good from a technological perspective that your primary question is, can this team actually build it? Or more fundamentally, can anyone actually build it? When that question is asked and answered in the affirmative, you are often left with a company that has a really remarkable product and a really remarkable lock on a market as a result. I think the strongest example of that today, you know, what I would call the biggest technological moat in the world is probably SpaceX, because here we are eight years or so after SpaceX first demonstrated the ability to land a rocket's first stage after delivering a payload to orbit, and no one else has pulled that off. You know, a few other companies are doing wet splashdowns in the ocean and controlled descents or trying to catch, you know, first stages with like, you know, helicopters with nets or hooks, but no one else is doing a controlled vertical descent. And what other technological innovation from eight years ago remains uncopied? And I think that's a, you know, a pretty interesting question to, um, to, to think about when evaluating technological differentiation. And I look for things like that. I may never find something as uh, profound or uh, as large as SpaceX's current uh, lead in the world, but you don't need to have something that crazy. 
Yeah. I want to go one level deeper on that and, you know, talk a little bit more about investing in technology risk versus competition, because it's a very different approach, you know, and and on the one hand, uh, it reminds me a little bit of a book I read recently was The Power Law, which is wonderful, kind of a wonderful, I don't know, overview of venture over the years. But one of the stories in there is around Tom Perkins and, you know, this notion of Perkins Law, of investing in, in areas where there's technological risk. And, you know, the way that he described it was, if a company can overcome the technological risk and the project is basically so ambitious that if they were to achieve it, it would have a massive impact, there's almost no way they won't have customers to be able to sell to, which is kind of a wonderful little, I don't know, flip on its head of, of the idea. Talk a little bit more about how you think about investing in technology risk and why why that's safe. Malaby's book was excellent, by the way, and the the story about how Perkins worked with the founders of Genentech to define what he called the white hot center and to de-risk that part of the business as quickly and in a, in, in a way as capital efficiently as possible was, I think, a really interesting framework for venture investing. I think you know a good example of this from my portfolio is my company, Gray Matter Robotics. Gray Matter makes software for industrial surface treatment applications to enable robots to do that kind of work. So what what is industrial surface treatment? Industrial surface treatment means things like grinding, sanding, deburring, and painting large pieces that are often structural components of major systems like aircraft or vehicles or wind turbines. Often they're made of composite materials or large, expensive metallic alloys. And their surface treatment needs and and parameters are very high. If you're putting a ceramic uh, or metal part on a military helicopter, that thing better work. If you're doing the same thing for a wind turbine, servicing a wind turbine hundreds of feet in the air is not easy. So you want that performance to be strong and good. And today, all of that work is done by humans. It's uh, the classic dull, dirty, and dangerous kind of work. There's no robotics company on earth that has been able to train robots effectively to take over this work from humans until gray matter. When I invested in the company a year ago, I scoured robotics companies all over the planet. And I found, you know, one or two companies doing stuff on, you know, small parts that are like tabletop kind of things. There's no one who can do this on a 40 foot part in the way that gray matter had already demonstrated. They did that because they spent, the the founding team spent eight years together in academia conducting the fundamental research that enabled that. Their, uh, their data room that they shared with me around their seed round had 65 technical papers published in IEEE journals. I read many of them. I won't admit to reading all 65, but it was pretty clear that this was a pretty unique team. And so subsequent to my investment, Gray Matter has proven the ability to ship product that works to customers with high levels of demand. They now have one of the most fun problems a startup can have, which is that they are getting cold inbound every week from large customers that have had no contact with them before saying, here's my specifications and parameters. Here's what we need. We've been looking all over the planet for somebody to do this for us. Can you help? We're desperate. And that's a great example. Like after years of work, both in academia and then in the spin out company, they now are in the position where customers are crawling out from under rocks to try to buy the robots from them. It's a great way to describe it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's an amazing position to be in. One question that that makes me think about is, you know, from your position, so you find this team, definitely top decile, probably much, much higher percentage of, you know, kind of people in the world qualified to work on this problem and to be able to solve it well. You have this highly technical team that's achieved this technical feat, you know, but ultimately to have a business that works, you have to have both, I think, amazing technology and amazing sales and kind of operations. And so the one question, you know, I would ask there is how do you then think about, okay, you have this team that's off the charts technically, how do you help them figure out the operational sales components of kind of getting that business off the ground and getting it scaling? Yeah. I mean, that goes to one of the fundamental questions that I always ask about teams. You know, if you've read books like Malaby's or listened to VCs talk before, they always say, you know, we want to find world-class teams and, you know, people who are the best. And 
sure, like we all do, but what does that actually mean? And to me, the three questions that matter when evaluating a management team are, can you ship, can you sell, and can you hire? To your question about sales ability, not everybody is born with the ability to sell expensive mission critical software to large corporations. Uh, they do not teach that in the K-12 or post-secondary uh, education system in America. It's amazing how different the skill sets are. I look for evidence that somebody on the founding team has been able to do this before, either at a prior company or in the early life of the company that I'm getting involved with. And if I don't see a founder's ability to tell that story in a way that leads to orders, it's probably not a company that I'll get interested in. Now, once I invest in a company, helping them to figure that out and to scale that is a big part of the work that I do. Every company has different challenges, but they often boil down to what does the source of leads look like? Where are they originating demand? Who's doing that? Whether that's you know direct founder outreach or whether they figure out marketing of some kind early on or have some other access to a channel. And then what do sales cycles look like and how do you price it? And I mean, every one of these has to slot in before a company really gets into true product market fit. And companies spend different amounts of time and different amounts of dollars to figure this out. And they're trade-offs against each other. The less money you spend, the more time you've got to figure this out. The more money you spend, the more it better work the first time. Yeah, that's a great way of, of describing it. I, I want to kind of zoom out for a second and just talk about the model and your focus at uh, you know Stage Venture Partners. And then I want to come back to robotics and industrial applications and gray matter robotics. But just to go a little bit higher level for a second, you know, so th- what I kind of understand about your model is, you know, you're a deep tech investor across a number of verticals. You know, I want to talk about those verticals in a second. You're also very early in that you focus on pre-seed and seed. And I think kind of the valuation you target is somewhere less than 10 million. Do I have that right? Right. And can you flesh that out a little bit more and maybe describe at a high level how you think about your thesis, your perspective, and kind of your approach? Yeah. So I'm investing in companies that are raising usually between one and three million dollars that have raised less than a million dollars in all rounds prior to the time that I'm considering getting involved. Usually the companies are very young. That ranges from 18 months or so on the high end to companies that were incorporated two weeks before I wrote them a check, which is somewhat common for me. And the teams are often three or four people and a dog at the time that I invest. And sometimes they're pre-product and pre-revenue, and sometimes they've got an early product live in the hands of customers. That's the financial and organizational characteristics of the companies I invest in, in terms of what industries they're working on and what kind of problems they're working on. From a vertical perspective, about 80% of my investments fall in one of four or five verticals. E-commerce infrastructure is a core part of what I do. Healthcare and life sciences software is another core vertical. Industrial applications, including robotics, is a third. A fourth is uh, space tech, generally. And uh, a fifth uh, is what I would call sort of like post-sales support software for all sorts of companies. Yeah, about 80% of what I do is, is in those verticals. In terms of like what's powering them, a lot of the technology that I invest in are applied artificial intelligence. I've got a handful of computer vision companies, a handful of natural language processing companies. I've got a handful of specialized data warehouses, and I have a handful of core systems of record or systems of engagement as well. I want to ask two follow-up questions. One is around, you know, so you focus on pre-seed and seed, which really in the scheme of things, there are very few, you know, percentage-wise venture capital firms that focus exclusively on, you know, seed and pre-seed. And I'm always really impressed by those teams. You know, and there's clearly... If you're familiar with venture capital, there's plenty of, I don't know, fund return arguments you can make around why that's the space you should be investing in. You're investing earliest, you're investing at the lowest valuation. But it's also very different than, you know, if you're a later stage investor, you have a lot of data that you can use to help underwrite the investment and do due diligence. If you're early stage, it's much more around team. 
why is that the right fit for you? And, and what do you think is, um, you know, kind of like helps you have a tight, um, I don't know, venture fund market fit <laughs> with pre-seed and seed investing? I guess I like chaos. <laughs> the earliest stages are very um, creative. They're very fast moving. No two companies will ever find product market fit in the same way, using the same tools and in the same time frame. Every one of these processes is an art, but there's also a lot of commonality to them. As I've now invested in nearly 40 companies since I started Stage, and I get the outside view on helping 40 companies through that journey, I have developed a pretty fundamental level of knowledge and expertise about what this takes. As I always tell founders, you know, my, my job is to sort of get you to 20 people and $2 million of ARR and your Series A, and I am often then handing the board seat off to the later stage investors who are the experts at getting you from 2 million of ARR to 20 to 200. And all of my attention is directed in that very early, um, very unstructured part of the life of a company. Uh, you're right, there is very little data. Sometimes I see companies put LTV to CAC ratios on their slides that they send me where they turned on their first customers two months ago. Like, how on earth do you know your LTV? You don't know that. No one knows that. You could tell me about your customer acquisition cost payback period. That's a reasonable metric of seed. But like, no one knows LTV. So yeah, there, there, there's no data. You know, the financial statements of the companies that I'm evaluating are trivially simple. They've spent, you know, a little bit of money on salaries and, you know, cogs on Amazon web services. They have no revenue or barely any. There's no financial ratios to evaluate. You do want to evaluate effectiveness and speed. And for example, it's somewhat common for, for me to meet a team or two doing somewhat similar things in a short period of time where one team has spent three or $4 million and the product isn't quite ready. They need that last $500,000, ideally for me, ideally tomorrow. And then everything is going to be amazing. And then like five weeks later, I meet another team who has a similar idea and they spent $40,000. They got the product live and in the hands of customers and they've been growing month over month and they've already shipped three major updates and revisions to the product. And you know, $40,000 versus 4 million is a 100 to one difference. And you would not think that there would be as many 100 to one differences if you had not seen so many of them. I'm in diligence right now with an enterprise software company that was founded late last year. They are about to deploy to their first beta customer slash design partner who's also willing to speak with me. And I have a customer call with them on Monday. And I can't remember the exact number, but I think they have spent four or $5,000 in the history of the company to get the product almost ready to be deployed to their first beta customer, like 5,000 bucks. Uh, That's next level efficiency. <laughs> that, that's my attention. <laughs> yeah, definitely looking at execution speed, scrappiness, the you know the ability to move really quickly is is one axis. Are you looking at all at kind of founder market fit? What other you know, and maybe to kind of ask that question in a little bit higher level way. If you know you were to like open up your brain and share your algorithm for trying to make these early stage bets, what are you looking at and what are you waiting? Maybe in addition to you know traction, speed, scrappiness, efficiency. I mean, the, the three core questions that I always ask are: Can you ship? Can you sell? And can you hire? The ability to ship software is sort of what we covered a moment ago. Some people are just better and faster and more efficient at that than others. A big part of that for me is that that has to be core to the founding team, essentially from day one. And Every once in a while, someone will pitch me and will mention that they are relying on dev shops or outside resources for their engineering and product development. I understand why people do that, but that's kind of an immediate pass for me. I have an opinion about dev shops that they are a perfectly acceptable solution for a large company that has a well-defined need. If you are an insurance company and you need a mobile claims app, by all means, go hire a dev shop to build that. You'll get what you want. If you are a pre-product market fit startup, let's not even talk about the worst case. Let's look at the best case. The best case with a dev shop will still kill you. And what I mean by that is that the best case is that they deliver what you asked for on spec, on time, and on budget. And that will still kill you. 
because no founder ever got their product right on a whiteboard or in their head from day one. They always have to iterate it. The customers always use the product in ways that are weird and surprising, often maddening to the founders at first. And it's only when they learn to accept that this is what the customers actually want, that you can reorient the product around that. You have to do that fast. You have to do that without mercy to your own preconceived ideas. And that's not how dev shops work. You know, only an internal team that is really motivated that's in the trenches can do that. And so for me, that that's kind of a, you know, a, a real killer to issue. The other ones that are, you know, so important are sales, as we talked about, and then of course, the ability to hire. This has always been important to me, even before our labor market got to where it is today in 2022, where it's just utterly insane and where we are fundamentally short skilled labor in all aspects of the economy, and we're likely to be so for the foreseeable future. If you have a choice as a highly skilled person, you want to work on something that matters. You want to work with people you like. You want to work on something that has a a potential for real scale and impact. A founder has to be able to communicate all of those things in order to convince somebody to quit their job at Salesforce or Stripe or wherever and come join, you know, four people at a company that nobody's ever heard of, where they're going to disappoint their mother-in-law, you know, um, everybody's going to be disappointed. You left Stripe for what? And you've got to do that. You've got to overcome that resistance as a founder to hire folks. And uh, not everybody is equally skilled at that. Yeah. Really well said. I mean, I love the way you articulated both those points. I want to, you know, kind of go back and and talk about industrial applications and robotics. And what I want to start with there is, you know, just talking about what do you love about that space and what do you see that's happening there now that excites you, that interests you, just broadly. Well, I think there's a bunch of things happening in manufacturing and industrial applications. Number one, is that I think we were sent the wrong signal by the last 40 or 50 years of deindustrialization in the United States. You know, labor went from, we went from in the 1950s, somewhere around 27 or 28% of Americans worked directly in manufacturing and in industrial applications. Today it's 7%. You know, one fifth of the labor force has been shed from that industry. And yet we still make more stuff than we did then. And that has been through automation through investments in capital rather than labor. But it has also made people feel like that's sort of the wrong thing to be investing in when I think it's actually not. The second thing that I think people miss about that is that a lot of the supply chains that were globalized, in in particular globalized into countries that have a hostile security posture against the United States are pretty vulnerable. And for the last two years, first with COVID, now with war, we are seeing the downsides of that degree of dependency on people who don't like us and who we may or may not want to like in return. And that has to come back. Like We we should be manufacturing the stuff we need close to home, whether it's in the United States or in, you know, other places like that, we should be manufacturing it in democratic countries that do not invade their neighbors. And we should be doing so with a diversity of suppliers so that we are not left in positions like we are today, where 3 million fewer cars are going to be sold this year than would otherwise have been for a lack of microchips. So all of these things are happening. A huge amount of risk was taken on over the last 40 years, and we are now paying the price for that risk. Now, we're not going to get manufacturing employment in the United States back to 25%. At the time that that was the case, only 7 or 8% of Americans were college educated. Today, about 40 or 50% of people under the age of 30 will complete a bachelor's degree by the time they're 40. I don't think anyone with a bachelor's degree is going to want to work doing industrial sanding and grinding of fiberglass. That's not what I think people do that for. As a result, if we're going to continue to make stuff out of fiberglass, then we are going to have to automate that entire process. And that's where I think a lot of the opportunities are coming 
in robotics. And then we're having similar issues in IoT for uh, production efficiency. We're having um, similar issues in supply chain management. We're having similar issues in traceability and make sure that product quality and production scheduling is all handled in the way it should be. And what I love about all this stuff is that there's essentially a never ending frontier of work to be done. The moment you optimize or de-bottleneck one step of a process, the bottleneck moves upstream or downstream and you have something to do anew. And the culture of manufacturing innovation in our country, influenced by Lean and Six Sigma and Kaizen, is very attuned to that idea of continuous improvement. And that means that there is always a tailwind for adoption of technology. Yeah, it's a fascinating articulation. I know that also, you know, one of the things that we talked about before, I guess I'll ask as a question instead of kind of stating it, was, you know, in part with these verticals, and it sounds like this is in line with that, you know, what you just described, which I think you said really eloquently of, you know, if you're investing in a space and you solve one problem, you remove a bottleneck, that bottleneck's immediately going to move somewhere else. And so it's this successive wave of innovation. And that's why, you know, venture works again and again and again is because the technologies that, you know, we ship and reach scale today lay the foundation for the next wave of innovations to come and, and basically overlay on, on top of them. But, you know, when we were talking before, you talked also about this idea of within a vertical being able to find one winner after another by basically just following the kind of stream of, of execution and evolution. Can you maybe, you know, flesh that out a little bit more and how that works? Let's talk about drug development. So a number of years ago, I co-led the, the pre-seed and seed rounds of a company called Verisim Life. Verisim Life makes biosimulation software to model the absorption, distribution, metabolism, and excretion of any new drug compound in the body's of over 20 mammalian species. Now, what do you use that for? You use that to help decide which of the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of potential drug compounds that uh, pharmaceutical companies are evaluating could or should go into animal testing. Animal testing is a time-consuming, expensive process that also yields results that are less useful and applicable than a lot of us would think, but that we have no alternative to because we do have to test in animals before a pharmaceutical company files and an IND to go into human trials because otherwise we wouldn't have any, any information about toxicity. That is what we test in animals for is for toxicity. You're not actually testing to see if the drug works or not. You're just you know testing to see if the poor animal goes kaput. Verisim's software can make very specific recommendations about which drugs are likely to have good outcomes in toxicity studies and which ones are not in the short run. In the long run, we might end up building technology that will allow us to skip animal testing entirely. Uh, how long that long run is, uh, I, won't, I won't venture a guess. That could take a while. But that's, I think, a really big opportunity. And for pharmaceutical companies, everything comes down to the ticking clock on patent expiration. And so if you can get a drug through animal testing faster and into a new drug application and into uh, human trials, you create a lot of value for customers. I mean, that is tremendously valuable. So I invested in that company in 2018. From there, I started paying attention to more about what was happening in clinical trials. I saw a lot of companies trying to do AI to like pick out the drugs and design the drugs. I saw Verisim and very few other companies working on that animal testing stage. And then I saw a few companies doing things in clinical trials, like um, enabling remote clinical trials and um, stuff like that. What I didn't see a lot in was enrollment. Enrolling patients into clinical trials is the primary cause of risk for a trial. Of all the trials that fail, about half of them fail, not because the drug failed to work, but because they couldn't get enough patients before the company ran out of money to keep con conducting the test. That means a really specific thing that is in many ways very troubling and sad, which is that on the shelves of pharmaceutical companies all over the world are thousands of drugs that work that have never gotten through 
FDA and comparable nation clearance for failure to enroll patients to prove statistically that they do in fact work. You know, we could we could have miracle cures out there that we don't know about. So my next company in that space, Diania Health, has built a really innovative physician-trained natural language processing technology to look at specific biomarkers, including time and progression of disease biomarkers. So you've had heart disease for a certain period of time and you qualify for the inclusion criteria of a clinical trial as a result. Diania has also focused very intently on the hardest clinical trials to enroll patients for, which are oncology and immunotherapies. Finding a patient who matches a clinical trial inclusion and exclusion criteria set for one of those markets can often be worth $10,000 just to find one patient. That's how hard it is. And so Diania has taught its NLP models using tens of thousands of hours of annotation by trained physicians. And they found an incredible physician labor pool that they were able to bring to bear to do this. And they now have a really, really fascinating model that no one else in the world has. Once you get through clinical trials, you then have the process of evaluating the data and reading all of the you know, tens of thousands of pages of information that comes out of that. And Diania works equally well on that part of the process to speed it up and, again, get those drug applications to the FDA faster while the clock is ticking. And so Diani is doing fascinating stuff. And I think that's a pretty good example of starting with one place in the life cycle of a drug and one place in the value chain and expanding into adjacent areas over time. Yeah. I also love, I mean, the theme that, you know, is shining through really clearly is I think in a world where a lot of uh, <laughs> venture investors invest in scalable, interesting things, but things that, you know, it's hard to argue that they have a real world, tangible human life improving impact. And I think across your portfolio, even just in Verisim and Diania, I mean, these are massive problems that to solve them obviously would move the the needle significantly on just improving the world and improving our ability to develop medicines. Yeah, I only want to invest in things that are very motivating to me. And, uh, you know, I have never gone through the trouble of filling out an ESG checklist or doing anything like that. But, you know, there are things that I'm not going to do. You know, I'm not going to invest in companies that help casinos to attract more customers. That doesn't excite me. Uh, I'm not sure I would feel great about that. I'm not going to do stuff in any area that has an obvious externality of some kind. And I only want to do stuff that is really ambitious and really exciting. That orientation has probably guided the verticals that I have ended up investing in. Yeah, I think it clearly it clearly has. I want to talk for a second. Um, I want to kind of switch pace and, and talk for a second about, you know, uh, so you can kind of look at where you invest in, in two different ways. I think one is at the kind of vertical level. So you talked about industrial applications, healthcare, life sciences, space technology, you know, to name a couple. But the other is then there are these themes of core technologies that are threaded through these. So, you know, computer vision, natural language processing. So I'm curious from your perspective, because I think this is somewhat unique to being kind of a deep tech investor. <laughs> one, I guess, which comes first? Or, you know, are you learning about these emerging technologies and then looking for interesting applications? Or is it by looking in these spaces, you're kind of finding these technologies? Talk a little bit about that, because it seems to me that you need to both be deeply knowledgeable at kind of both levels. Yeah, a lot of it is kind of bottoms up. I'll give you an example with what I do in voice technology and natural language processing. A number of years ago, I invested in a company called Balto Software that does real-time coaching for call center agents. So it is listening to a call center conversation, it does so by plugging into the soft phone systems that they have from the likes of Ring Central and Five Nine and a bunch of long tail vendors that are nowhere near as good as those two. And it hears what customers are saying and then helps an agent to know what to say to ideally close a sale while they're having that conversation. Call centers are high churn labor environments. They're often thought of as cost centers for their employers. There isn't a huge amount of innovation that has happened there, but they're also where a huge amount of customer service is delivered for better or worse. And Balto developed 
its product that had no latency, that had integration with a lot of these long tail, horrible core systems, and has delivered a huge amount of value to their customers. There are customers who use Balto who had conversion rates on conversations of 3% before Balto, who now have 6% conversion rates. And like that changes a customer's business profoundly to double the conversion rate. You can't help but pay attention to that. And I started to see that there were a lot of apl- applications for voice technology and natural language processing. So subsequently, I invested in a company called Vocalytics that is working on that for remote patient monitoring and customer service standards in healthcare applications like hospitals. And then I've invested in a company called Datch, which makes a Siri-like interface for field service workers in manufacturing, utilities, natural resource uh, exploration and other areas where they're working with their hands and they don't have time to log data or retrieve data using either a smartphone or a pen and paper type of system. And everywhere I go, I end up finding these kinds of additional applications of voice technology. And then of course, voice is only part of what Balto does. That's the speech to text aspect of it. For Balto to work, you then have to understand the text. That's natural language processing. And from the natural language processing applications that I've seen at Balto, I then invested into a company called Thankful, which does automated customer support for e commerce merchants. It allows somebody who opens up a chat or an email service ticket to resolve complex service requests that often involve real money without a human ever being involved. Thankful's AI can process returns, replacements, crediting accounts, questions about where's my order and things like that in over half the tickets they get without ever having to escalate to a human and where the customer often never realizes that the person that they are corresponding with is not actually a person, but an AI. And that fundamentally changes and improves the quality of customer support that a growing e-commerce brand can provide. Yeah, it's an incredible, uh, obviously, service. And I mean, the fact that it can resolve 50% of tickets and do so with things that are complex, complex, but also involve things that you would typically maybe as a business want to gate and only allow humans to do is obviously, I think, a profound, it's a profound technological application. I, I want to talk for a second, kind of switching paces to talk a little bit about space technology. I'll ask in a, in a second around what's exciting about that space and what feels special now. But I want to talk by just kind of diving into one of your portfolio companies. Can you share the story of Epsilon 3, how you ended up finding it, what they do? and why it's so fascinating. Absolutely. Epsilon 3 is based here in Los Angeles. They are a company developing automated mission management software for space missions. The founder, Laura Crabtree, spent uh, four years at Northrop Grumman and then 10 years at SpaceX. At SpaceX, she was part of the team that worked on Falcon 9 reusability and Dragon reusability. And then for the last four years while she was there, she was essentially the head astronaut trainer at SpaceX as that company was gearing up for its first crewed launch, which was a couple of years ago. And in fact, during Crew Demo 1, when the United States returned to manned spaceflight cap- capability after a decade without that, after the retirement of the space shuttle, Laura was on con when the astronauts were calling down to mission control. The voice that they were talking to on the other end was Laura. And there's some great videos of, on YouTube of, uh, of her work there. While she was there, she realized a few things. Number one, that with first Falcon 9 and then Starship, which uh, is almost ready for testing at SpaceX, and then all of the other rocket companies that are now either in service or will have their first commercial launch in the next year or two, there is about to be an explosion of access to space, but the tools have not kept up. And what I mean by the tools have not kept up is imagine mission control. It's launch day and you see a team of rocket scientists sitting in rows of consoles and then they've got the big screen up front with all the cool orbital diagrams and stuff like that. I thought that like what was on screen for those guys was really sophisticated 
purpose-built software. I learned from talking to Laura that it was PDFs. Like we, we launch stuff into space. We manage orbital parameters. We manage procedures in space using spreadsheets and PDFs. And obviously that's not the best way of doing it. And Laura realized that there needed to be an equivalent of engineering productivity tools, um, Asana or Jira or GitLab, if you will, for hardware engineers building space missions and then other types of uh, software as well, uh, or other types of applications like all the new aerospace stuff happening. So she launched Epsilon 3 with her co-founder, Max Mendick, who is a multi time founder whose previous company is one of the leading drone defense companies in the country. And uh, Max uh, connected with me through a buddy of his who's an LP in my fund. And uh, my LP made the intro without mentioning the context. So I wasn't sure, you know, it's like, yeah, I'll be happy to meet this guy, Max, but I didn't know it was a pitch or anything. And he then told me what he was doing, walked me through the deck and um, I saw what he was doing. And I was so impressed that I scheduled a follow-up meeting two days later. And then, uh, worked as fast as I could to be an investor in their pre-seed round. And I ended up uh, being the largest investor in that round. And uh, that company has just done tremendously well ever since. It's amazing. Yeah, it's amazing what they're working on. I want to talk for a second around what is... So when I zoom out kind of from that application, and I've spent a lot of time over the last year reading, researching, learning more about the ecosystem of companies that are building something to do with space. It's a fascinating area because obviously in that example you talked about, it's software specific. A lot of stuff in space that you would invest in is obviously software and hardware. It may be even much more hardware forward. So it's fascinating too to find plays that are kind of application software layer of space. But, uh, you know, the, the sense that I've got and that I still have is that it, we're in the middle of a profound transformation in space. And I think you, you see that both in terms of what you talked about, the number of launch providers, you know, for anyone paying attention, I think whether you're looking at Rocket Lab or Astra, it's just fascinating to see these, you know, multiple companies outside of just SpaceX, which gets a lot of attention and should get a lot of attention because what they've done is incredible. But there is starting to become, I think, a really fascinating ecosystem of players in space. What are you what are you seeing and what do you think feels feels special and unique and interesting about this moment in time. What's happening in space is a fundamental reorientation of the cost of getting into space and as a result, the things that you can do with it. If you required a manned mission like the space shuttle to get a payload into low Earth orbit, it would cost you about $65,000 a kilogram back in those days. If you didn't require that, if you wanted a Delta rocket or an Antares or an Ariane, it was about 10000 SpaceX can do it for you today on Falcon 9 for $2,600 a kilogram. So, I mean, we've already had a huge cost reduction as a result of the reusability and the vertical integration that SpaceX has enabled. A year or two from now, when SpaceX has Starship operational, the unit economics are going to be profoundly better than that. Starship is fully reusable, first stage and second stage. It is made out of essentially commodity materials. This is not aerospace grade composite materials that you're seeing here. They're making the stuff out of stainless steel. I mean, it's basically a giant refrigerator that will be capable of being launched into space. Fully reusable with the ability to use uh, more commodity fuel and with a, just a much, much, much bigger rocket. I mean, Starship is so much larger than Falcon 9. It's, uh, it's kind of amazing. The result of that is that depending on whose estimates you believe, it might cost less than $100 a kilogram to put anything into low Earth orbit. And the amount of stuff we can put into low Earth orbit might go up by 100 times relative to the amount of payload to orbit or even payload to deep space that we are able to deliver today, literally a hundred times larger. I think every company is gonna end up needing a space strategy. I think the number of organizations that get stuff into space is gonna go up tremendously. Every company will have a satellite of some kind, every research university, every country. I think that 20 years from now, a lot of good high schools will have space programs and that college applications for engineering schools are going to have a section on it that says, tell us about what your satellite does. And if you don't have a satellite, please explain why. And that parents are going to fund their kids' satellite science projects with car washes and bake sales. 
That, that's how much is about to happen in space. And that's going to fundamentally change everything we do in space. Everything we do in space is based on ultra precision, on things never going wrong, on the most expensive materials possible, because launches are rare, expensive, and infrequent. And so you damn well better get everything right the first time. A space telescope is a great example of that. It took more than 20 years to launch that thing. I'm 42 years old, and I've been looking forward to when they launched James Webb for over half my life. They had to fold the thing into this incredible set of contortions to fit into the nose cone of the Ariane rocket that they used to launch it. And they then had this Rube Goldberg machine of opening it, all the risk that's entailed to doing that when it is beyond the range at which it can be serviced. And so you got one shot to do that right. That's why the thing has cost, what, 12, 13, 14 billion dollars, whatever it is. With Starship, you don't need to do any of that. You don't need to fold it up because the nose cone is so much larger. And you don't need to do 14 billion dollars worth of quality assurance. You can just build like 10 of them for that cost. And let's say the first three launches blow up. Who cares? The fourth will work. And so it just, it fundamentally But it was an incredible feat. <laughs> I, James Webb is an incredible feat. It is the last of its kind. We will never build yeah. a monolithic scientific instrument at cost like that and with risk like that ever again. That era in space is over and the stuff we're going to be doing now is really different and we're going to have to really reorient our assumptions about what is scarce and what is abundant in space. If mass is no longer scarce in space, if it is cheap and easy and fungible to put kilograms into space, we're going to do different things and we're going to send different types of kilograms into space than we send today. And a lot of my investments in space tech are based on that transition that is underway. And in particular, I believe that a whole layer of software instrumentation needs to come to bear in order to make that happen. So I've got companies like Slingshot Aerospace, whose Beacon product is emerging as one of the leading collision detection and avoidance software products for satellites so that we don't have runaway chain reactions of collisions that create a lot of space junk. You know, anyone who's seen that Sandra Bullock movie, Gravity, kind of knows what I'm talking about. That's called Kessler syndrome, where you just end up with a lot of space junk from ongoing collisions. I've got a company called First Resonance that has software to manage traceability, production scheduling, and supply chains in complex manufacturing like space tech. I've got Epsilon 3, which does automated mission management. And I've got a company called Pruitt Ridge, which is making engineering collaboration software for requirements management in space and other complex applications. Those last three companies, all three of those, the founders spent substantial times in their career at SpaceX. Which also leads, you know, to another fascinating point about where we're at, which is you see this happen all the time. People refer to the PayPal mafia, all of the founders, you know, that came out of PayPal or had some sort of genesis or spent their early years at PayPal, um, like Peter Thiel, who have since gone on to do things. And I think it also goes to prove that just having a company like SpaceX succeed and get to scale and do so in an ambitious way is an enormous good, if not just only for all of the entrepreneurs that are now spinning out and going to be building, you know, other parallel tangential things around space, uh, which is amazing. And, you know, mafias tend to come out of hard environments and payments on the internet 22 years ago was the wild west. Any kind of payment product on the internet in 2000 or 2001 was essentially an open bank vault with an invitation to fraudsters and thieves. And PayPal's culture and their engineering capabilities were forged by the intense operating environment that they were in and the difficulty of all the bad guys seeing an unguarded piggy bank in that company and everything they had to do to hold them at bay. SpaceX's you know, hard operating environment, I think, is somewhat self-explanatory. 
Yeah, I love that insight. I haven't heard it articulated that way, but I think that's absolutely true when you look think back to the examples of of those mafias. Um, and it's an you know an un it's not doesn't get enough discussion, but I think obviously overall building a startup, working in a startup is very difficult. But there are definitely I think you know you raise that bar significantly at a company like SpaceX or PayPal or Square or Stripe or others, where then just the bar for execution not only is what you're working on very hard, but the bar for execution <laughs> and for what you want to ship and for what you want to build yeah. is very very very. There, you know, there are not mafias for companies that don't have those challenges. Like, you know, the idea of an IBM mafia is laughable on its face. It's like, you're really going to develop that culture of uh, scrappiness and experimentation and resilience from selling mainframes. Call me skeptical on that. You know, there's no Oracle mafia. You know, there's just, there are not at least today, in, in the 80s and 90s, there were a number of companies that did come out of Oracle, but there's no mafia coming out of today's Oracle. And so there are different conditions that lead to different results. And SpaceX uh, is certainly, uh, I think, the best company today where those kind of people are being forged and where they're seeing the opportunities all around them. And I am fortunate to uh, be based just a few miles from Hawthorne. And I'm fortunate to have uh, been introduced very early on to a number of great people out of SpaceX. That's so cool. I want to ask two closing questions. One is, you know, for anyone watching the video version of this interview, if you're listening to the audio, you're not going to see this. But behind Alex is this kind of Andy Warhol piece of artwork with Warren Buffett. And, you know, one of the things that was fascinating when we were first talking about doing this interview was learning that um, I think you've been to, what, 18 Berkshire Hathaway annual meetings? Something like that, yeah. (laughs) And, you know, there's obviously, I think, for any investor, Berkshire Hath- uh, Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and Berkshire Hathaway are an influence in, in some way, shape, or form. How have they influenced your approach? And how, because I think people might think, wow, these are super far afield. You're doing deep tech venture work. <laughs> you also are inspired and drawn to Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger. What have you gotten from going to that many annual meetings from the ethos and from just Warren and, and Charlie's kind of worldview? Yeah. I mean, I've always been both a public equity and a um, private equity investor. I've always had one foot in both uh, worlds and VCs and long-term equity investors are sort of the same thing. We're focused on unit economics. We're focused on fundamentals. We're focused on long-term compounding and they're not as contradictory as you would think they would be. Certainly old school value investing is much more focused on things that don't change, whereas venture capital is expressly focused on things that do change. I think that there's been a lot of innovation among my friends in public market investing to update their thinking of around what they've learned from Buffett and bring that into the world of software and faster growing and and Industry is more prone to change. Um, some of my friends like uh, Marcelo Lima of Heller House in particular have made uh, pretty substantial changes in the way that they invest with very strong results um, thanks to that. But there's still a tremendous amount to be learned from Buffett. And the value of the Berkshire Hathaway meeting is less about what Warren and Charlie say and more about the fact that 40,000 people go to it. And so it's got some of the best investors from all around the world in all asset classes who come there for a weekend. It's funny, I've been to Omaha 18 times. I've never been to Omaha anytime except for the first weekend of May. And I don't think I know all that many people in Omaha, but I see a lot of the same people and that's why I go. I mean, it's a, it's really valuable to to meet with all of those people. I mean, the questions that are asked at the annual meeting sometimes make me want to rip my hair out because they're not all that great. Uh, it's gotten better since they had the journalists doing that because otherwise you get a bunch of well-meaning 10-year-old kids asking what they should do with their life. And again, it's nice for the kids, but like that's not what I'm flying to Omaha for. But uh, yeah, so the questions are not, you know, or, and what Warren and Charlie say is not going to surprise anyone. I mean, I can practically lip sync their answers to most questions because I've read enough of how Warren and Charlie think that it's not going to have a lot of surprise there. But having that many great investors in town for 72 hours is a a really wonderful community. And I would encourage anyone who has not been to go because Warren and Charlie are not getting any younger. And I suspect that one day that event will not be what it is today. And I don't know much else that's going to ever be like that again. Yeah. 
And it's so much fun just to be at the event, walking around the convention center, visiting the different booths, <laughs> looking yeah. at all the businesses that, you know, Berkshire Hathaway have. But yeah, I think that the most fun part of it is the community. And yeah, I've only been once and I would love to go again, but the people I met there were just, you know, some of the best and smartest investors I've ever met. It's absolutely incredible. And I love that you made that point that, you know, I think their approach, long-term business ownership is very, very, very similar to venture capital. I just think most people don't see it that way. I want to ask one closing question, which is, you know, we talked about at the beginning that just from your approach, you're investing in solving very difficult technological problems. You know, you've been doing this for seven years, which is a long time in and of itself just to be investing in kind of allocating capital. But the companies that you're investing in, these are things that will play out for likely decades to come. And so you have a very interesting, I think, perspective of patient and long-term capital applied at the earliest stages. Maybe just close out by talking about how you think about patients, long-term ownership, and, and how that plays into your views around investing. Well, in venture capital, it is especially seed venture capital it is by definition a long term asset class. You know, it, it takes time from being, it takes time to grow from three founders and a dog in a WeWork to ringing the bell on the NASDAQ to go public. And that's unavoidable. And that's just the nature of the asset class. I think what I kind of invest in probably even adds a little bit of time to that because product development is a little bit more intense. And convincing the first handful of customers that you actually have something that solves a problem that they have always had is a little bit more intense as a result of that. I'll say in my public market investing, I would have made far more money if I've never sold a share in my life. It's amazing how many things I have gotten right that took a lot longer than I expected them to, but that ended up being far larger than I expected them to, you know? Seeing a stock today that's at you know two hundred and fifty dollars a share that I bought for five dollars a share at the bottom of the financial crisis in two thousand eight really drives that home. You're thinking, man, why don't I own every one of those shares I bought in two thousand eight? Still, you know, I thought I was such a genius selling those shares for forty bucks a share, and man, was I not. And I think venture capital, by the structural illiquidity of what we do, allows you to capture the full value of the things that you are right about. And it allows you to build a portfolio of diverse and asymmetrical investments that have the chance to surprise you to the upside in a really attractive way. And I think it also shows you that like, what causes the death of companies is often not what you think. Most founders seem to believe that it's competition, like the other guy's going to beat them. And I just don't see that. I mean, you know, I've always said that that startups die from suicide and cancer more than they die from murder. And I, I, I see that. I mean, I've, I've never had a company beaten by competition. I have had companies that have completely failed, but never because of competition. They have failed because they have not found product market fit. They have failed because they couldn't raise money. They have failed because their unit economics started to break down. They have failed for all sorts of reasons. That's going to continue to happen. But competition isn't really one of them. And that's one of the, I think, surprising and, and fun things about the world of software today. There is so much opportunity in software that you can always carve out a niche that you can dominate if you're creative and energetic enough. And the market, I, you know, there's a concept in evolutionary biology called a fitness landscape. It's like a three-dimensional expression of um, how a species can survive in an ecosystem. And if the fitness landscape is flat, it means that the species are in perfect competition with each other. And there's really very few markets in tech like that. You know, I would say like rideshare is probably it. Like Uber and Lyft have the same product. They have the same drivers. They're in a tough business against each other. But in enterprise software, the fitness landscape is often very jagged and you could end up dominating a peak that has no one else on it. And, you know, maybe the peak you dominate is one that generates 5 billion of enterprise value and you're not going to be Salesforce with 250 billion of enterprise value, but 5 billion is a nice number. Yeah. 
That's a great, it's a great number. It's a great number. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, so well said I have, it, this has been a fascinating conversation. I love your approach. I love the, you know, the specific companies we dove into. I just love the way that you think about this because I think it's very deep. It's very nuanced and it's very different to be frank than, you know, I think a lot of investors in the space. Um, so thank you so much for the time, Alex, for anyone listening, you can follow Alex on Twitter at Alex Rubalcava, R-U-B-A-L-C-A-V-A. And you can learn more about Stage Ventures at stagevp.com and also at Twitter at, uh, at Stage VP. Thank you so much for the time, Alex. This has been amazing. Thanks, Daniel.